Here's an idea. You can trademark a color, but it's a weird thing to do, and people might get mad. This episode is brought to you by Hover. In 2014, Surrey Nanosystems, a British nanotechnology firm, invented a new pigment called Vantablack, which was at the time the darkest substance known to man, capturing 99.96% of light which hit it. I've never seen it in person, but on camera at least, objects coated in Vantablack appear flat and empty, like they're a hole cut into space itself, revealing the infinite void hiding within every object. <laughs> Unlike normal pigments, which are often a particulate matter that's mixed with water or oil to make paint, Vantablack is grown. It's made up of carbon nanotubes, a microscopic forest comprised of chain-link-looking shapes 10,000 times smaller than a human hair. And that traps all of that light, creating that unreal blankness. Last year, Surrey Nanosystems developed a spray paint version for small objects, and as of a few months ago, they announced Vantablack 2.0, which is so dark, their spectrometers can't even measure how much light it's not reflecting. How much more black could this be? And the answer is... All of which is very cool. Cool enough that it's newsworthy. Vantablack has all kinds of applications, managing light inside and around telescopes and other astronomical equipment, inside infrared instruments, coding for the hands of this $95,000 watch, and a few applications in circuit design that I just barely understand. But those things aren't what made news, not at first, at least. What first made news was this guy. This is Sir Anish Kapoor. He's a British artist, most well known in the US for The Cloud Gate in Chicago. He also just unveiled a new piece in Brooklyn called Dissension. And he is the exclusive licensee able to use Vantablack in art. This has made some people very upset. Kapoor is, by most accounts, a great artist. I like his work a lot. His Marseilles at the Tate Modern was insane. I recently saw Eyes Turned Inward at the Museo Barardo in Lisbon. It's really awesome, has some crazy acoustic properties, but is he so good that he should have exclusive access to a brand new shade of black? To Surrey Nanotech, the arrangement works because Vanta Black is hard to apply correctly and safely. It's hard to make so they don't have a lot of it. So if anyone's gonna use it to make art, it might as well be a world famous sculptor who has demonstrated great skill with color. And to hear Kapoor talk about the situation, it makes sense because it's almost like a collaboration, almost like Vantablack itself is a work of art which he is helping Surrey realize. But some folks in the art world, they see red when they see Kapoor's name next to Vanta Black. British portraitist Christian Fuhrer says, nuh uh. He says that allowing only one person to use this new shade holds the art world back. He told the Daily Mail that it isn't right that it belongs to one man. Belgian artist Frederic de Vilde told Quartz, personally, I find this type of monopoly rather absurd and stifling. Stuart Semple, an artist and pigmenter, pigmentier, pigment. Maven? He was so miffed that he took the bender bending Rodriguez route and made his own version of Vanta Black. I assume without nanotubes, though I don't know for sure. It's called Black 2.0, and uh, we bought some. When buying this, I actually had to promise that I'm not Anish Kapoor or an employee of his, and that I'm not planning on selling this to Anish Kapoor or an employee of his. Stuart applied the same restrictions to his ultra sparkly glitter and also his pinkest pink, which we also got. Though, by the look of Sir Kapoor's Instagram, the terms are less enforceable than ideal. In the comments of this photo, you'll also see tons of people posting with the hashtag share the black, which, okay, gets us finally to the first big set of questions. Is this a thing you can do? Can you stop people from using a color? Or maybe more controversially, should you try? And even if you can, and you should, why is it that people seem to take this sort of thing so seriously? So there's a pretty long history of protecting colors. And by pretty long, I mean just under 60 years. A big first happened in the art world too. While there have long been artists whose work is associated with colors or combinations of colors, it wasn't until the mid 20th century French artist Yves Klein worked with paint supplier Edouard Adam to develop International Klein Blue, or IKB, that a specific shade became so strongly twinned with a single artist. Klein made a bunch of works using IKB, from paintings to sculptures to lots of stuff sort of in between. IKB became Klein's trademark color, but 
He never actually trademarked it or patented it. It's often reported that he did, but he only ever submitted a solo envelope for the method of its creation. In France, a solo envelope is a kind of record of invention which might precede a patent application, but isn't the same as one. What Klein did patent is a method he used to create many IKB paintings, specifically viewing the entire composition from afar because the paint is actually applied by naked models. It was the 60s. So IKB is often used as a precedent for an artist with exclusive rights to a color, but it's a bit of a false one. I mean, other artists use it, including Kapoor and the Blue Man Group. There are, however, plenty of businesses who have trademarked colors. And just as a brief aside, a trademark is a form of intellectual property that defends symbols or words associated with a company or organization. The Nike swoosh, the PBS P head, the AT&T Death Star, those are all trademarks. Marks of their trade, which identify them with all of the stuff associated with their brand. And so they are protected by IP law. But it turns out in certain situations, a color can act as a mark and be protected like one too. As long as the color is strongly associated with a specific product and that color isn't functional. These are called color marks and legal precedent for them in the US was set in 1985 when Owens Corning got the pink color associated with their insulation protected. Tiffany blue is protected on boxes and bags. Louboutin red is protected on the soles of shoes. T-Mobile magenta is protected amongst telcos. UPS brown for shipping companies and Wiffle yellow for plastic bats. Cadbury purple is not protected though. Courts said that they were too broad in their request. They wanted to protect Pantone 2685C in an excess of uses and situations. John Deere green isn't protected either because it has an aesthetic function. Lots of farm equipment comes in green and people like to buy matching stuff. So if John Deere was the only company allowed to make matching gear, they'd have an unfair advantage. One company also tried to trademark black boat motors and were prevented because a black coating makes motors look smaller, which boating enthusiasts Sailing. prefer aesthetic function. But okay, granted, this is different from a nanotech company granting exclusive license of a color that's difficult and even dangerous to produce and apply to a single world famous artist for artworks. But the color mark laws might provide some insight into our other questions. Should colors be protected? And if they are, why might people flip out? Hashtag share the black. Color marks are awarded based upon a strict association that has built up over a long period where protection isn't originally provided. I couldn't start Mike Rugnetta Industries tomorrow and be awarded a color mark for fluorescent orange light bulbs because no widespread recognition between light bulbs and fluorescent orange exists. I'd have to work my way there and it would probably take a while. So this is one Kapoor exclusive license counter argument. Artists and audiences are being asked to develop an association between Anish and this incredible shade of black before it has had time to develop. One reasonable fear, especially in the art world, is that the association will stick. For how long might all extreme blacks mentally conjure Kapoor and his work, even as other methods for their distribution arise? American painter and sculptor Donald Judd wrote that color, like material, is what art is made from, explaining that no association a color possesses is so strong it can't ever be challenged, but that color, every color, nonetheless possesses meaning. This gets us to the second big point. Color has meaning, but not like a clear one. Part of that has to do with how the perception of color itself is mysterious. Renowned artist and color theorist Josef Albers put it this way when writing about the color red versus the word red. When we consider further associations and reactions which are experienced in connection with the color and the name, probably everyone will diverge again in many different directions. We may each think of something reasonably red-like when we hear the word, but each mental red is probably different. Likewise, we may look at the same red shade, but its associations, a high school football jersey, our favorite lipstick shade, a Coca-Cola label, will differ person to person. Which is to say, color is very personal. The experience of it is deeply subjective. So fundamentally so that the question about what color even is has caused disagreement between scientists, psychologists, and philosophers for ages. Do things have color or do we perceive facets of things which our brains interpret as color? Is there such a thing as pure color, freed from shape, texture, or experience? It's within color's very nature to belong in some way to the people who experience it. This provides one explanation of why color marks are so weird and 
fascinating, which I think they are. And I'd guess that people agree. If it's inspired a dozen listicles, it's probably at least mildly fascinating, right? Color marks are a way of saying that a company gets to have a color, a thing which is at once unhavable and had in its own special way by everyone who sees it. And it also provides an explanation of hashtag share the black and the ire around the idea of a shade being so tightly controlled. The shade is already shared in that we've experienced it, but also never shared in that we can't use it. Unlike a color mark, an association has been created, but access is widely limited. This fact conjures some already disappointing things about the art world and its renowned obsession with economics, ownership, and scarcity. Devilled to Quartz again says, buying exclusivity of using a color is rather ridiculous. It's most likely an institutional reflex, an expression of a fear, the desperate desire to own art which is maybe melodramatic, but speaks to what's perhaps so upsetting about Vantablack's exclusivity. It reinforces, or in one view forces, a kind of ownership that seems at odds with the thing itself. The question may come down to what Vantablack is. Is it a color or a material? And us deciding if Kapoor's exclusive right to have some black goop is more or less galling than his exclusive right to a whole new shade of a color. But it may also come down to what we think of artists as being responsible for making. Does Kapoor as an artist make objects or does he make experiences? And if he makes experiences, then maybe there is something somehow wrong or simply dismaying at an attempt to claim a monopoly on one. What do y'all think? Is it strange or dismaying that an artist has exclusive license to this new shade of the color black, or is it totally dope and fine? Let us know in the comments and I'll respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. Thank you so much to everybody who came to VidCon and who said hi. Thanks to everyone who came to the PBS DS d and Q&A, who came to the Nerd Night, who came to the meetup. It was great getting to see you, great getting to see everybody uh, that we get to hang out with at VidCon. Great to hear what you're thinking about and working on. It was, as always, a huge pleasure. So yeah, just thank you, thank you, thank you. In this week's comment response, we talk about your thoughts regarding Magic the Gathering and Jazz. If you want to watch that one, you can find a link in the doobly-doo or wait for the end card to show up. For next week's episode, we are going to be doing a Q Q and A episode, which we haven't done for a very long time. So send me your questions. Uh, give them to us on Twitter, on Facebook, on the subreddit, and in the comments below. Uh, I'm gonna make a post on each of those, uh, including a, a stickied, uh, a pinned post, a pinned comment below. Uh, and yeah, let me know what you wanna know about. Ask me all kinds of questions. Um, please also uh, thumbs up or like other questions that you see that you want answered. I can't guarantee that that means I will answer them, but it certainly doesn't hurt. Uh, we're gonna be shooting that next Wednesday, so you have until Wednesday morning Eastern time to leave your questions or vote for what's already there. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit, links to those in the doo doo The tweets of the weeks come from, first, Leaf on the Wind, who points us towards a Magic the Gathering bracket, where uh, an organization is attempting to figure out the best Magic the Gathering card, which, um, I mean, if you go check it out, you will see that it is quite the undertaking. And also Tom Rivlin, who points us towards an Ian Bogost piece for Atlantic about Binky, the app that does nothing. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's good. And hey, in case you were wondering, this episode was brought to you by Hover, which helps you buy and manage domain names. Hover has over 400 domain extensions, including .com and .net, and also more unique domains like .car, which I'm gonna use for my website of Disney Cars fan fiction. Hover domains also come with custom email forwarding to Outlook, Gmail, or whatever you already use. With Hover, you can get a custom domain and email address for 10% off. Go to hover.com forward slash idea channel today to create your custom domain. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the very hard work of these sharers of the black.